cults. A community devoted to the gospel of their self-proclaimed prophet. Tell me in a sentence who you are. A prophet who had isolated members of their flock and twisted their ideologies and morals before systematically destroying their lives. In this case, we will be delving into one cult, one whose prophet is considered by many to be one of, if not, the most evil person alive and investigating the years leading up to their infamous conclusion. Marcus Wesson was the leader of its polygamous cult. He believed it was his job to make children for the Lord and taught his children that they were better off dead than separated from the family. And when some of his daughters slash quote wives threatened to leave and take their kids with him, Marcus decided to fill out his deadly prophecy. And after a standoff with the police, he fulfilled it and killed all nine children in the house. Heartbreaking stuff, I know. To understand how we got to this point, we'll have to start from the beginning. So sit back as we dive into the beginnings and discover the making of a monster. August 22nd, 1946 is the day the topic of today's video was born. A monster, born to Benjamin and Carrie West, with Marcus being the oldest of four children. Marcus claimed that his mother, Carrie, who worked as a nurse, was a religious fanatic and was a part of the Seventh-day Adventist church. Carrie conducted Bible studies every day of the week and wrote multiple volumes of her own interpretations of the Bible, particularly the Book of Revelations from the New Testament and the Book of Daniel from the Old Testament. Benjamin Wesson, on the other hand, was a United States Army veteran who served in World War II until receiving a pension for being injured in the war. He returned home where he was described as being an alcoholic child abuser who left the family when Marcus was young. It was also believed that Benjamin molested his children, including Marcus. His sister testified that their father was more inclined to hug and kissed them while he was drunk. She said that they learned to hide from him until he quote sobered up. Benjamin, as I stated before, would later on leave the family. For what reason? To have an affair with his 18 year old nephew, which led to him abandoning the family for nearly a decade. Benjamin would return to the family, reprising his role as a father as if nothing had ever happened. By this time, the Westons had moved from the Midwest to San Jose. It was said as a child, Marcus enjoyed pretending to be a preacher. He enjoyed leading his flock and being the center of attention. As a young man, he would start combining the beliefs of the Seventh-day Adventist church with his own beliefs of polygamy, incest, and even vampirism. He convinced himself later on in his life that his family were vampires with souls. He would also later state in an incestuous statement, quote, produce the seed of perfection in oneself which she wrote in a manuscript in the night of the light 
for the dark. Which on a funny note, he tried to publish this as a book, which apparently detailed his life and understanding before this millennium. But as you expected, it was declined by the New York publishers, where they described the book as unintelligible, or as one employee would bluntly put it, it makes no sense. Okay, I'm done fucking around, but let's continue. Marcus's mother described him as a quiet individual during his childhood, who took care of animals and even saying that he would apparently regularly bring home strays in an effort to take care of them. In the only interview Carrie did after the murders, she told the story of when Marcus was young that he took care of a dog who was on the verge of death. And after a night of giving the dog milk, as we expected, Old Yeller was wagging up his tail again. Which on an unrelated note, personally, I don't believe the story. I mean, come on. He fed the dog milk, and that somehow brought it back to perfect health? Yeah, I thought so. Marcus wouldn't do too well in school, dropping out opting for an alternate path in the US Army in 1966. But later on, in 1968, he was then honorably discharged soon returning to the US, where he would start dating a woman named Rosemary Solario. However, even though this sounds like a good turnaround for the next chapter in Marcus's life, to the regrettable thoughts of his family, what would happen would be nothing short of terrifying. In 1971, Soloria gave birth to Wesson's first son, along with eight children she had harbored from her previous relationship. Even though Marcus was already in a relationship with the established Solorio, what Marcus really had his eyes on was her eight-year-old daughter, Elizabeth. In 1974, Wesson began sexually abusing Solorio's eight-year-old daughter. In an interview with Elizabeth Wesson, she recounts Marcus telling the eight-year-old Elizabeth that she belonged to him and that she was already his wife. Even saying that Marcus convinced her that she was special and that the Lord chose her to be his wife. Marcus would ask Rosemary for permission to marry her daughter Elizabeth, in which she agreed to, and he soon hosted his own unofficial wedding ceremony at the home. While Elizabeth was pregnant at 15, she and Marcus married officially. Four months after the marriage, Elizabeth would give birth to their first child. Marcus was very controlling and abusive, enforcing strict rules about what they could say how they could act, and even what they could eat. Marcus would use tree branches, belts, and even television cables to beat and whip the children if they quote, acted up. Eventually a family member reported the abuse to the police, and Marcus agreed to leave the house if the family agreed to not report the abuse. He also made a deal with Rosemary, who at this point wanted to leave, but Marcus would make her choose between one of her sons or the van. She obviously took her son, and so Marcus and the rest of the children took the van and left. They lived temporarily at his parents' house before settling in their own place in San Jose. And after a while, Elizabeth and Marcus would then have 11 children, with one dying at birth and another die of meningitis as an infant. The family at most was living off welfare checks until the children would reach the legal working age, which then Marcus would take the money they made from their work. Throughout the years, they would live in a trailer, a large army tent, and on a rundown boat in Santa Cruz Harbor. In the 1980s, Marcus bought some land in the mountains near Santa Cruz. Marcus would make a makeshift house that had no electricity or water. He would soon after fail to make the mortgage payment, so the house would be taken away. After that, Marcus would come into ownership of a boat that was located in the Santa Cruz Harbor. People in the area would report seeing Marcus being rowed to shore on a dinghy by the children, similarly to a group of slaves. Eventually, Marcus would be arrested for welfare fraud for not listing the boat as an asset, and spent a short time in jail. Soon after getting out of jail, Marcus would work out a deal to live on a quarter acre of secluded property on a rent home basis. You see, Marcus would go to large lengths not to work, so to make things even worse, Rosemary Solorio's sister would send seven of her children to live with Marcus. The sister herself had a drug problem, and the children had been abused and molested while in her care. The kids were excited to be out of their mother's household, but little did they know, they were being placed within the hands of another abuser.
To give an even deeper look into Marcus' cult, incest again played a heavy part of Marcus's religion. And to do this, he practiced something he called loving. And loving is just a prettier word for molestation. Some of the girls testified that Marcus would teach them oral sex around the ages of 8 or 9. They even took care of Marcus washing his dreads, scratching his armpits, and probably more disgusting shit like that. The control Marcus had over his family was unbelievable, to the point that if any of the girls were caught by Marcus talking to a man outside of the family, they would be beaten to the point of drawing blood. This would extend to not only the outside of the family, but even the girls' brothers, who weren't allowed to talk to their sisters and vice versa. The girls had to wear long sleeve shirts and had to wear skirts down to their ankles to cover the bruises Marcus gave them. And when the girls were out with Marcus, they had to walk behind him with their heads down to not attract attention from other people. The boys in the family were not spared of the abuse by Marcus as well. It was testified by one of the boys that Marcus's beatings were so bad that one situation caused him to not be able to stand for weeks. And he even said he would soil himself because of the beatings and how bad they were. The children were so well hidden that many neighbors didn't know they existed until the tragic end. On March 12, 2004, early in the day, two of Elizabeth's nieces, Sofina Solorio and Ruby Sanchez, came to where Marcus was keeping their children and demanded that Marcus give them their children back. He'd recently said that he was planning on moving everyone to Washington State. So when Elizabeth came home, she sees Sofina and Ruby. Sophia is screaming, give us our children back. And Ruby is yelling, he wants to take our babies. They also found out that Marcus had broke his promise and was still molesting and having sex with their daughters and nieces. When Sophia entered at Marcus's home, she attempted to grab her son, Jonathan. And that's when all hell broke loose. Marcus would grab the child away from her and would stand in front of the door preventing anyone else from coming in. Sophia said that many of the girls had called her Judas, which is another word for traitor, with one girl, Sabrina, even calling Sophia an adulterer for leaving the house. And when Elizabeth sees all of this happening, it opens her up to what terrifies me the most about this case, and that's the hold Marcus had over the children, in which she freezes over with fear realizing this. Then, Elizabeth and Sophia leave the home, and that's when law enforcement arrive on the scene. March 12th, 2004, at 45 p.m., Elizabeth Soloria would re-enter the house, immediately noticing that there was no noises coming from the house. No children crying, no footsteps, nothing. What she walks into was a dimly lit room in which she can see Marcus kneeling with his arms wrapped around her 17-year-old daughter, also named Elizabeth. Along his shirt drenched with blood, with wooden coffins lined up against the wall, and next to it was a pile of lifeless bodies of her children, her nieces, her grandchildren, and her great-nephews. Each child was shot in the eye, with them being stacked from youngest to oldest. Elizabeth, when coming upon this, would run outside of the home, falling into the arms of a police officer. 4.47 p.m. Wesson emerges with blood on his clothes and surrenders. Officers enter their home and find the bodies of nine children. Marcus Wesson is definitely one of, if not the most evil person I've ever read about. I also want to say that it's easy in these situations to blame the other people around the situation. I personally want to emphasize that the mother at this time, who was also killed by Marcus, was 16. And considering the amount of abuse she went through, I don't think it's fair to say she was responsible, or in any magnitude, ever. In which she can shame her for, of course. Overall, all the blame should be focused on Marcus and Marcus alone. Marcus is truly the most depraved and malicious person I've ever had to read about. And I truly do wish that the people affected by this actions are doing well. Thank you guys for watching the video to the end. Subscribe if you want to see more of this shit, and... I'll see you guys next time. Bye. I'm messing with your name, but I think you're really cute You like me for a thing, I'm like bad attitude 
but baby, I'm insane. I don't wanna fuck with you. X O baby, I feel like you hate me. Oh no, baby, sorry that I'm crazy. But fuck you, sorry I was that too far. 